Ephesians chapter 3, Revelation chapter 17 and 18, if you would turn to both of those places. You start with one and hold your place there and go to the other. Yeah. Some tasks are just not easy for some people. Galatians or Ephesians chapter 3, Revelation 17 and 18. Appreciate you all being here. Uh, pray for um, Graceland. She was having a seizure just a little while ago. And uh, she's, she's awake now, but I, that just really, that bothers me to see those little ones like that. And um, you just can't help but feel for them. And her and Reagan will just deal with that, I guess. I guess that's the grace that God's going to flow in their life is how to live with that. Right now, the grace is being administered to their parents on uh, being the parents of uh, children that uh, have to go through that. So pray for them. Um, just pray, pray for and love one another. Uh, this just seems to be in my heart today. And uh, what's in my heart tonight, I don't know, this just came out of the blue. Um, but I, I, when I was studying upstairs today, I, I kept going back to um, a place here in Ephesians 3. And my eyes just kept going back to that verse, kept going back to that verse, back to that verse. And um, there is a connection between that and Revelation 17 and 18 dealing with Babylon. And I'll share that with you uh, here in a minute. Let's read uh, Ephesians chapter 3. Um, we'll start in, um, oh, we'll start in verse 3. Uh, and we'll read down a little bit. Um, remember, this is dealing with the mystery. And um, this we're going to finish that up tonight, I think, uh, as far as dealing with the, the last mystery, which is uh, mystery uh, Babylon. Uh, verse 3, How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me am who am less than the least of all saints. I, I just, I admire Paul's humility. Um, popes and preachers alike love to exalt themselves or be exalted by other men. Um, let's see here. I'm not sure who this is. Pastor Mike, please pray. Um, and the church, pray for my daughter Amanda. She was taken to the hospital because she had a seizure. Huh? Oh, no. And she had a, uh, and while at the hospital, she had another one. The first one caused her to pass out and stop breathing. It uh, must be seizure day. So stand, we will. And um, we'll have a word of prayer here in a minute. So you pray for us, we'll pray for you. Um, anyway, let me, let me read this again. Uh, Paul is referring to the mystery and then, um, let me pick it up in verse seven, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Re remember what I said this morning about waiting on the Lord, because Anything, anything good that happens to you, through you, by you, or whatever, 
is going to be the work of God in you. It's not going to be your own work. So if it's the work of God, then it's the timing of God as well. And if it's the work of you, then you will want to rush it. You'll want to either delay it or get too early into it. And it won't be right. And God won't bless it. And you'll be frustrated. Uh, but if you wait on the Lord and let God be God, and uh, I promise you, he will work effectually in your life. Uh, in verse 8, I was mentioning about Paul being... Uh, humble and how men, again, they either exalt themselves or they have people exalt them so that they can be exalted and seen as being exalted and being lifted up. And I'll be honest with you, it's not just popes and it's not just, uh, it's not just, uh, the liberals and everything else. I went to a, um, a, a a preaching conference, um, I won't say where, but it was like a camp meeting style preaching conference. And a lot of the, uh, I would say, it, you know, in any movement, there's always big names and name guys that everybody wants them to preach their revivals and so on. And it was, it had a bunch of people like that. And for about two and a half to three days, I listened to more men praising than I ever wanted to hear. And these were all guys, they were all conservative preachers, King James, um, and so on. And uh, I'll be honest with you, some of the preaching I found extremely lacking because it was far less than Bible-based. Uh, but it was, it was all this, well, God, oh, God bless, uh, if it hadn't been for brother so-and-so, we just wouldn't, this movement wouldn't be carrying on. I'll tell you what, we had just, oh, a gratitude attitude to, to brother so-and-so. He's done more for the kingdom of, and it's, I listened to this for three days. And, um, I was not in a good place anyway. And God was just really dealing with me, but I list, I listened to that and I'm just going, I don't, I don't think I'll, I don't think this is for me. And, uh, it just really, it really bothered me. It really did. And that kind of stuff, I it just, I don't want any part of it. I don't. Um, you know, it's good to be acknowledged. It's good to have people that love you and people who, who appreciate the things you do and so on. But as far as being exalted, that, Follow the Apostle Paul in that. I, he said, I'm the least. I'm less than the least of all saints. He says in Romans 7, he talks about uh, Christ died for sinners of whom I am chief. And um, that's just how he wanted himself to be known. He knew not to exalt himself or let others exalt him, that Christ should be exalted. Unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And I can tell you that I've been searching through this Bible for the riches of Christ for years. And I'm telling you, I've not finished searching the unsearchable riches. You'll never get, you'll never get all of them. Uh, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now... Under the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be made known, might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now these next two verses, uh, are where my eyes kept going to. Um, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Wherefore I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. For this cause, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he's, 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 I'm going to read it again. I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. If you've not taken into account nor read uh, in the Bible... 
of the account that the Apostle Paul gave of the things that he had suffered in his life since becoming a preacher of the gospel and since becoming a Christian. I encourage you to do so. The man faced what, in my opinion, uh, for me, if unless Christ gave me the grace and the power and the strength uh, of both body and mind and will to endure it, um, the thing, if I would have endured half of what Paul had gone through, I, pr I probably wouldn't have, I probably wouldn't have made it. Um, beaten numerous times, stoned so much that they thought he was dead. And so they quit throwing stones at him. And after everybody left, you know, his, his uh, disciples started pulling the rocks off of him and dragging him out of there and he was alive. Um, the number of people that wanted him dead, tried to kill him. Um, he just, and then the last, uh, few years of his life being imprisoned at first, literally being in a prison dungeon, uh, and having to deal with that, finally being allowed to live, uh, sort of like in a in-home prison type deal. Uh, and then taken to be killed. Um, I don't remember how tradition says that Paul was killed. Um, no, that was, that's the story of Peter. Peter, the story that they have on Peter was that they were going to crucify him and he said, I don't want to be crucified the way they crucified Christ. So they turned it upside down. I don't know that that's true. Uh, I think Paul probably would have, would have been beheaded, if I remember right. Uh, but we don't have any sure word on that, just, uh, just stories by tradition. Uh, but Paul ended up being killed uh, simply because of what he believed. He believed in God. He believed in Jesus Christ and he preached it. And that's what he was killed for. Um, so I want you to think about that tonight. Um, because... I'll tell you who's behind that. Babylon. She's the one behind it. Father, we ask your blessings on your word tonight. And, and Father, uh, I pray, Lord, that um, it was made known to us that uh, one of our church family, Lord, one of our brethren, Brother Stan, uh, his daughter has uh, fallen ill. And we pray, dear God, that you would, uh, that you would bless her and restore her back to health. And Father, for um, Graceland as well, that, uh, Lord, you would restore her back to health and um, put that cute smile back on her face. And Lord, just bless her, bless her mom and dad. Lord, Father, increase their faith uh, and their trust and their confidence in you. Uh, teach them, Lord, as they go through this part of their life, Lord, help them to grow in faith and grow in grace. And I pray, dear God, Lord, that uh, through these trials that they're facing, Lord, in their life, God, that you would make them stronger. Lord, that you would increase them, that you would better them. And Father, they would uh, continue, Lord, many years down the road to be serving you. Uh, as well as their family, their children serving you as well. And Father, just bless your word tonight. Help us, dear God, this is not a subject we like to think about, but Father, I pray, dear God, that you would open up our eyes and help us to understand, Lord, the reality of persecution in this world happening uh, to your saints. And uh, Lord, help us... Uh, we, we, we don't have to know exactly uh, when your, your timing of your appearing in the clouds has to happen. Uh, but Father, Lord, open up our eyes and make us realize, Lord, that we will endure fiery trials in this world before we leave out of here. And that there is a, a real evil harlot spirit 
that seeks our death and seeks our torment. And I pray, Heavenly Father, God, that you would give us the grace to say to you and to this world, my faith is real and I don't mind dying for my faith and my Savior because he died for me. Father, help us, Lord, to be a blessing to your kingdom, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, let me read that again. I'm going to read that again. Verse 13, I kept my eyes, just kept going back to it. Wherefore, I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Paul would go through beatings. He would go through uh, men trying to take his life. There, If you remember in the book of Acts, there was men that separated themselves out with a Nazarite vow. And uh, no, I'm thinking of something else. But anyway, they separated themselves out with a vow and said, uh, we're not going to eat. And we're not going to take bread until we have succeeded in killing Paul. Now, unless God wants Paul dead, those guys better plan on starving to death. Because if God doesn't want Paul dead, they're going to die first. Guarantee. And that's, I don't know, I don't remember exactly what happened, but that was the deal. Uh, that they decided they weren't going to eat nothing until they had seen Paul dead. Well, Paul didn't die then. And Paul was allowed to go on by God to preach and, and to build churches and to uh, raise up bishops for those churches and lay out doctrines uh, for all of the church, even us today. And that was Paul's life. And, he, and he's begging those who know his plight and know what he's going through at that time, he's begging them, don't, don't faint. At, and, and, and he doesn't mean faint in the literal sense like you pass out. But don't, don't let it bother you too bad. What's going on with me? Don't worry about me. What I, what's happening to me, I've accepted. Um, it's better than what I deserve, but I've accepted it. This is the work of God, and through my sufferings, it is my hope that people will be emboldened then to live for Christ and not be afraid of persecution because they've seen me go through it, and they're like, if we see Paul go through it, and God brought him through it, then we can do it. It's the same God and the same grace and, and so on and so on. So now turn to Revelation uh, 17 and 18 in a simultaneous super state. That's a, a quantum physics term. I've been going back over some things on quantum physics and... Uh, What, what is next, just very quickly, for those of you uh, who are listening, what is next to be greatly feared is that on one hand we have um, artificial intelligence that now is working on a grand scale. The more data that artificial intelligence collects every single day, the smarter it becomes. One of the things that are, is worrying those who work with chat GPT, in case you haven't heard of that, that's how you and I can access an artificial intelligence system and ask it practically any question. One of the things that is alarming those who work with ChatGPT and are maintaining it and watching it and so on, is that it tells things that are not true and they can't tell whether it's deliberate or not. In other words, like somebody asked uh, ChatGPT to list some of the most famous sayings from the script of the original Star Trek series. And it listed a bunch of sayings from the TV show Star Trek. 
And people that know the show noted that ChatGPT got it wrong. It wasn't correct. And they don't know if it did it deliberately or not. Now, this thing has access to every script from every TV show ever. And all it would have to do is, you know, in a matter of a few seconds, read every one of those scripts uh, and measure out from the vast amount of information that it has, which ones are the most popular. But it should have access to the scripts to know whether or not those, what it put out was true. So it's kind of alarming. So we have a, an artificial intelligence system that truly is very intelligent, but it's not being truthful. And so here's what scares me now. One thing that scares me is that the artificial intelligence uh, people is going to begin to work on a grand scale at forcing the artificial intelligence computers to only tell things that are 100% true. Now, here's what scares me about that. We know that the people working with these artificial intelligence computers do not, for the most part, believe in God nor Genesis 1. And so, while we maintain that Genesis 1 account of the creation is 100% true, in the future, when you ask ChatGPT about the creation, it will tell you that it's not true. And because they're going to enforce this idea that this computer cannot lie, then it will enforce to this world that we are wrong. And see, this is already happening with Google, with YouTube, because there are things that I cannot say because of YouTube. YouTube putting out this narrative that what they say is true is the only truth. And I cannot say anything against that. And that is very troubling to me. And it's, it's over two things that I, I, I won't say I don't care about, but they're not on the scale of the gospel. One of them is with the election. The other one is with COVID. And I can't talk about those subjects on YouTube. What happens then when it gets to the gospel? And they determine that it's not true. I will not be allowed to say that without a penalty. And this is where we're going. The second thing that is troubling them is uh, the advancement again in quantum computers. And I, I won't. I won't try to explain. Hey, guys, listen to this. Now, this is your generation stuff, okay? I want you to hear this. This is very important for y'all. Because you It is very important that you listen. Very important. I can't explain how quantum computers work, but I will tell you that they operate in a higher dimension, they tap into the fourth dimension to figure out things and then report them back in our dimension. And I'll, I'll give you an example. There is a, a formula, and the scientists came up with this specifically for this reason. It's a very simple formula. I don't know what formula it is. But apparently it involves prime numbers and factor. And prime numbers are pretty hard to figure out once you get the higher up you go. And there's a formula that requires working with prime numbers 
that if you ran the formula on the fastest supercomputer in the world right now, it would take 10,000 years to compute the answer to it. 10,000 years. Google built a quantum computer and this quantum computer, when fed this formula, tapped into the fourth dimension and in 200 seconds returned the answer. That's not, that doesn't even qualify as being distant. That is insane. And something else about quantum computers. Whereas a regular computer, if it's going to try to play a chess game with somebody, will look at one move after another and try to figure out what their move would be. And then if they move this, what I, what move I would make. And after I made this move, if it made this move, then what, what I would do. And then it does that one after another. And it does it at a very amazing speed. But a quantum computer takes a chess game and once somebody makes the first move, it looks at every single possible move all at once. All at once. And returns the winning moves to win the game. That is nearly to the point of being a god. Because what you're doing is, you're not only being more intelligent than the person you're playing, you're prophesying accurately the exact game that they're going to play. And only after a few moves, you've already won the game. Because you already know exactly what this person, that is. And, and they use this model now to look at all kinds of things in this world that man ha has been puzzled over, but now we have the ability to, to access this other dimension and the computers then can generate prophetic answers and be right. Remember what Deuteronomy 13 said, if a, if a prophet or a dreamer of dreams hath a sign or a wonder, and the sign of the wonder come to pass. And then the prophet or the dreamer of dreams says, let us go after these other gods. Hey, those other gods could be computers. You don't know. Let us go after these other gods. God said, see, I allowed that because I'm going to test you whose side you're going to be on. Now, watch this. So we have, a, we have computers now that are operating on a nearly God-like scale. And we're going to mix it with an artificial intelligence system that knows practically everything knowable. And a lot of scientists are, are saying we probably shouldn't do this. We probably shouldn't mix quantum computers with artificial intelligence. But guess what? They're going to do it. It's um, even if it becomes, even if Congress says, we're going to outlaw this. Because what power would even Congress have over an artificial intelligence system with a near godlike proficiency and ability to think and the ability to never, ever, 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 in any circumstance, be beaten by any human at any time. A system that would figure out a way to keep humans from unplugging it is what we're talking about. So what power would Congress have over that? What, what power would all of mankind together have over that? Zero. Zero. Especially now, if they start forcing chat GPT, these artificial intelligence systems that everybody in the world has access to, to only tell 
what they deem to be 100% true. Okay? That, that will, in essence, at some point, outlaw the Bible. And outlaw the gospel. And outlaw what we believe. And then there will be penalties for us believing something that they have determined is not true. Because it's already happening. So now, Revelation 17. This mystery. And there came out, there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will shew unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So her, the wine, the, the buzz that people would normally get from wine or from strong drink, they get it from fornicating. Is that true? Yeah. We know it's true. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads. The woman didn't have seven heads, thank God. And ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was the name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And notice verse 6. And this is something I, I've not really been talking much about as I've been going over this. But it just seems like God would have me say this. I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints. And with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Turn, uh, take your Bible and turn back to... Um, you stay in Revelation uh, and look at chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6. Um, verse 9. When he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain. For what? For the word of God and for the testimony which they held. You see, see what I'm saying? The Bible even tells you that people, that Christians, that saints are going to be killed. They're going to have their heads cut off. No, they're just slain is what it says are going to be slain, number one, because they believe the word of God and they hold it to be true, and the testimony. Our testimony is not necessarily, well, this is how I got saved. Our testimony is that we testify to the truth of the Bible. And we say we believe every word in the Bible. We believe Genesis 1. We believe Genesis 7, the story of the flood. We believe Genesis... Uh, uh, 14 and, and 15, when uh, Moses and the Israelites crossed the Red Sea, we, we believe that. Um, we believe that there were giants on the earth in those days. We believe in dragons, and we believe all of these things now. We believe them, and we believe that God's Son died on the cross, rose again from the dead three days later, lived and preached to more than uh, 500 people and then rose up into heaven by a cloud and people saw that happen. And we believe that happened. We believe it. And here in the fifth seal, we have people who were slain for that very reason. Why is... I don't understand that. I don't understand... A, a normal person, a normal reasoning human being who would think it such a crime that I believe in an, a loving God who instead of making us pay for our wrongdoings sent His only Son to pay for our wrongdoings. What is wrong with that? Nothing. But because it's God and because it's His Son, Jesus Christ, 
then we know it's his enemies that are causing this. And one of his number one enemy in this context here is mystery, Babylon the Great. She hates Jesus. She hates God. She hates God's word. She hates, think of her, think of her as a, a, a feminist who has the powers of Satan himself. That's who Mystery Babylon is. She hates realms of, and areas of biblical authority, meaning she hates it when a family, a couple says that the husband will be the head of the house and the wife will counsel him and help guide him and be his helpmeet. She hates that. And she says, that's evil, that's bad, that's terrible. Um, she hates the idea that men can own land. Because her spirit, I think, is related to Gaia, the Mother Earth spirit. And Mother Earth is the one who is telling all these people, Oh, they're harming me. They're cutting down my trees. And all oh, that makes it so painful when they cut down my trees. People actually believe that. I know people. I'm related to people who believe that. I'm related to a guy who believes that for a living. Okay? And I'm, I'm just telling you, these people, they honestly believe that the earth is suffering under the evil conquest of humans and that we need to rid the earth of humans in most places and there's a thing called rewilding and it was done on a large scale after hurricane katrina after hurricane katrina there was areas that these people got a hold of that they said now that we've got people out of there we're not ever going to let people move back in and it's called rewilding we're going to let it turn back into a wild wilderness area where all these different plant and animal species can thrive. Okay? And uh, nobody can touch them and nobody can do anything against them. And that's, that's her spirit is what it is. She hates... See, here, here's God telling Joshua, every place the soles of your feet touch will I give to you. And here's Gaia Babylon saying, I don't want that man owning me. No man owns me. And so she gets very, very vile and very hateful and very evil. And she goes for blood. Let's look at that verse 6 again in Revelation 17. I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints, with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Uh, turn in your Bible to Genesis 4. You're going to see her open her mouth and drink blood. You're going to see her do it. Verse 9, Genesis 4. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, what hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. You see now why I attach Babylon to Mother Nature, the earth, she opened her mouth and drank Abel's blood and liked it. And that was probably her first taste of human blood. And once she got a hit off of it, she said, I got to have more. And murder and death were the norm now on earth. Um, there is, I've mentioned this, there is 
a chemical that is produced by the blood of human beings called adrenochrome when a person is undergoing extreme terror or extreme torture the body produces adrena I guess would be related to adrenaline so it, it is some some form I would say of adrenaline and your body produces this adrenochrome in your blood I guess to possibly help endure whatever torture you're going through it is believed then that children's actually produce more of it in their blood which is if you hear crazy internet stories of people uh, buying children in a children child trafficking scheme using them for immoral purposes then torturing them to drink their blood I can tell you from the scriptures that 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 is true there is no doubt in my mind now that this happens no doubt in my mind um, we are told that the the buzz or the high that adrenochrome generates is more potent than any drug ever made by man so once a person who actually does this though they may find it disgusting the idea of drinking someone's blood after they've done it once they'll do anything like a typical drug user they'll do anything to do it again and people who have power in this world not just politicians but people who have power in this world are the people probably most likely to be involved in child trafficking schemes child in fact I would say this there would be no child trafficking if everybody who was a politician or a government bureaucrat of some kind would not partake of it there would be no child trafficking if if every government servant of any country if every one of them were pure and had never taken the blood of a child before then there would be no child trafficking because they would shut it down with the power of the government they would shut it down and make it nearly impossible for that to happen but the mere fact that it happens on a grand scale in practically every country in the world including the United States of America so we don't like to think of our country as doing this but I'm telling you it's done and it's done on a grand scale and it's being allowed and permitted and enabled by people in key positions of government whether it's elected officials or bureaucrats those are unelected government agents that don't have to worry about losing their job every four years because they have a government position and they hold the keys to the doors that allow the children to be trafficked in and out of this nation um, that you might as well join the conspiracy because it is true uh, let's turn to first Peter if you would very quickly I just I, I just want to I guess every now and then I think that we should be sober and be vigilant and understand that it's very possible 
that our generation of Christians in this country and in this world could suffer great persecution. It's not something we look forward to on, in the natural man. My natural man wants to stay alive. My new man says, would you die already? Okay. Um, verse 6 of 1 Peter chapter 1. Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season. If need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire. Name three people in the Bible. You, you, this section here. Name three people in the Bible that were tried by fire. Just this group here. Three people in the Bible that had a fiery trial happen. Jaden. What'd you say? I can't hear you. You know, I don't have a problem hearing you on a normal basis. Horshack, toothache, and who? Yes. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. Right. And, and did they survive? You think they were afraid? Yeah. I kind of do. I would be. Did they believe that God would save them? Yeah. But did you know what else they said? They said, even if God doesn't save us, we're not, we're not going to bow to that. You see, at some point, young people, most of you are my grandkids. At some point, you get to it. A place in your life with Jesus and you say I don't care what happens I don't care if the devil kills my whole family I don't care if I lose everything in this world I'm not gonna turn my back on Jesus now we can't say that just our normal self God helps us to make that decision. Anybody who says they're never going to be afraid is not being true, truthful. They're just being arrogant and trying to show off like they don't get afraid of nothing. Um, turn to uh, chapter 4. In verse 12. Beloved. Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you. It is going to happen as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. Verse 14, it says, if you be reproached for the name of Christ, which sort of means persecuted and hated. Happy are ye for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you on their part. He is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, 
what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. And what you're saying is, and what this is saying is, I may lose my body, I may lose my life, I may suffer pain in this world, but my soul will always belong to God and when I die, I will be with God forever. Forever. See, once somebody kills you, they can never kill you again. Ever. Isn't that neat how that works? So once you die, if you're saved, you only die once. If you're not saved, you die twice. And with that death, you know it for eternity. And it's not going to be good. Remember, she hates us. And she has, over the years that I have been both a child in this church, a teenager in this church, a young married man in this church, youth minister in this church, pastor of this church. I've seen Mystery Babylon use one scheme after another, after another, after another to try to destroy this place. Let me give you a, a little church history and I'll let you go. The, the actual church, Bethel Free Will Baptist Church, actually began in 1968, but the church itself in a different form existed all the way back in the late 50s. A church up in St. Louis decided to put a mission church in the Festus Crystal City area back in the late 50s. And it was called the Twin City Free Will Baptist Church. And that church went into the 60s and at some time in the 60s, there was a church split. Uh, these people didn't get along with these people for some reason. I don't remember what it was. This is all, when I first became pastor, I, I took the, the books of the meetings out and I read them for the first time in my life. I learned some of the history of the church. And, um, and they kind of just stayed mad at each other for a while. I don't, again, I don't remember what the issue was. Um, but there was this church... I don't remember the name of it. Might have been like First Free Will Baptist Church or something like that. But anyway, um, they called in a pastor, a man uh, from North Carolina. Uh, he was uh, Pastor A.B. Brown. And he came and I don't know who led the work, but I think they decided to just drop whatever it was they were mad about. And the two churches that had split from each other joined back together under a new name in 1968 called Bethel Free Will Baptist Church. Now at that time, they were uh, meeting at a church building that they owned uh, over here off of Gamel Cemetery Road. However, that place where the church was is now under Highway A. Okay, Highway A did not exist at that time, but they were going to put it, it was called 21A. It was an extension of Highway 21, and it was going to be County Road A that went from Festus to Hillsboro. And so the church had to move, so... 
uh, I think brother and sister Waymeyer, I think they own this property and they lived in a little house up here toward the street and they tore the house down, they gave the property to the church and the church built this building uh, starting in the early 70s and going into 1974. And that was uh, the first time we started coming here. I remember going to the little church on Gamble Cemetery Road a couple times. I remember going over there. Uh, but mainly I, my, re, my memory goes to the first time I was here in October of 1974. And um, so that's just a little, little history of this place. But um, I'm glad that the people who were mad at each other decided not to be mad at each other anymore. Because those are the people that I went to church under while I was a boy. But the, the thing was, Babylon tried to destroy this church all the way back in the 60s and wipe it out so it never existed, which meant that I would never have come here. Never. I could see the hand of God. And um, since that time, there have been, there was another split in the late 70s. Only these people didn't form another church. They just went to other churches. And uh, we had a pastor that was able to bring some of them back in the 80s and so on. And, um, but there's just a lot of things that the devil has tried to do to this church over the years to destroy it. And it, uh, it must be God's church. Because it stands against the gates of hell pretty good. Amen. Let's stand. Let's pray for our church. Okay? This is all we got, people. This is what we got. We don't There's a there's a couple that they're coming here now because the church they're going to they said are they're doing things that we just don't approve of. They're not right. And um they said, we like the fact that you say things that need to be said. I said, I didn't always. And uh, that's the, that is the reason why they're here. They're, they have left their church because of how bad it's going. And they've decided to come here at least for a little while. And uh, that blesses me. That blesses me. So pray for your church, okay? Father, we come before you tonight, and Lord, we know that we know the devil hates us. We know that Babylon despises us, desires even to drink our blood. She is that evil. And Father, we know that there has been persecution. There will be persecution. Some, Lord, have already paid a price just just to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Father, I know, Lord, that it's scary to the kids. I was always scared, God. You know I was as a boy hearing sermons like this, afraid that people were going to come and get us. But Father, you've, you've shown us over and over and over that you, that you save your people. You saved Noah and his family. They didn't die in the flood. You saved Lot and his daughters. They didn't die when Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed. You saved Israel from Pharaoh, who was going to come after and kill every one of them. But you saved them by opening up the Red Sea. And so, God, you are a saving God. And Lord, I pray, Father, that these young people, that you would instill it in their hearts, God, that they're going to be Christians in their life. And that they want you to be their Savior. They want you to be their God. They want you to keep them from evil and from letting evil Things and evil people hurt them. 
So God, at the age that they are now, while they still have a, a young, trusting heart, Father, my prayer is that they would always trust you. And Lord, that you would honor that and you would bless that forever. And Father, that also goes to all the families that listen, that watch these services. Father, bless their families as well. And Lord, I know the plight of many of the people, Lord, that follow our ministry and how the devil's tried to tear up their homes and their families. And Father, I pray, dear God, that you would help restore families and you would bring children back like prodigal sons, Lord, that you'd bring them back and restore them. May God teach our children, Lord, that even if they go astray, they can always come back. Bless us tonight. Father, bless this church and keep it safe, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.